Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. Welcome to YEGMS, episode number 47. Today I have the great pleasure to present to you my conversation with Robin Baldwin. Robin Baldwin is a lifestyle coach, an MS warrior, an author, and a podcaster. And I was really happy when I got her email and asked when she asked if she could be on the show. She's a fellow Canadian, and an all-around really great person. So I'm not gonna draw this out. Here's my conversation with Robin Baldwin. I want to welcome Robin Baldwin. Now I really butchered the pronunciation. How can I not pronounce Baldwin? Robin Baldwin <laughs> to the podcast. Robin, thanks for doing this. I'm so excited to join you on your podcast. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem at all. So. You reached out to me on, I guess, like what, about a week and a half ago. Uh, I had a chance to look through your website, and you've got a book, you've got a podcast, you've got a blog. Um, and I was a little bit familiar with you because in the Alberta edition of one of the MS Society magazines, there was a story about you in it in the same month that they uh, wrote a story about me in the very first really long run to end MS. So when I went to your website, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I recognize her. And I went sure enough and I looked back at the magazine and that was you. So, Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So why don't we, I mean, you, there's a lot to cover because mm-hmm. you're doing a lot of different things. So <laughs> why don't we just start with how you came about, I mean, when you got diagnosed from MS and then I'm going to ask you questions about all kinds of stuff off your website. So why don't we just start with your MS story? For sure. So I was diagnosed in December of 2014. Um, It actually happened fairly quickly for me. As I learned after my diagnosis, it's not always that way in the MS community. So over the course of a week, my fingers had started going numb and it went up my hand, arm, torso. I thought I had a pinched nerve. So I went to see a chiropractor. Uh, He did all of the neurological tests that many of us are very familiar with um, and said uh, it was a it was actually a a new chiropractor to me so we did a full intake and at the time he asked me you know about disease history in the family and my father has MS and I hadn't I didn't even think anything of it and I think something kind of like lit up for him he's like if well if this continues you know please go and get x-rays which is weird to me because you can't find MS through x-rays, but I think he wanted to kind of rule out that it wasn't a pinched nerve or something going on with my spine. Um, and then over the course of the, the weekend after seeing him on a Friday, it went down my torso, just like pins and needles, the numbness, and then the full right leg. And then on Monday morning, I woke up and my right foot had gone numb. So the entire right side of my body was having a little bit of a a panic attack with itself. And I just drove myself to the hospital to try to get answers. So the long and short of it is um, I, you know, went in, they gave me a CAT scan. They said, "Mm, you know, nothing's wrong. Go home. If it continues, come back in a few days. And I was like, "Mm, no, no. can't like let's keep looking what else can you do and the emergency doctor said well I guess I could give you an MRI but we only have a few slots during the day and those are for 
you know, um, emergencies, you're not really an emergency. So if you hang out, I'll try to fit you in. Cool. Great. I waited, I think like another eight hours, had my first MRI and then I was sitting in a, uh, in a room with just a curtain around it. And the, they called in an internist and the internist came down and said, you have demyelination, which is indicative MS, but we can't diagnose it unless we have a brain scan. So you're going to have to wait around for another MRI. I was like, okay, so you're basically telling me I'm, I have MS, but you're not really sure. But thanks for planting that thought in my brain. And they put me on a gurney in the middle of the hospital hallway in front of the nurse's station. And I had to stay there overnight, basically bawling my eyes out, researching <laughs> researching MS at the same time. Um, what year was this in? 2014. 2014, okay. Yeah, got my second MRI with uh, the dye contrast. And it was a brain scan because they had just done my spine. Uh, and that's when they found over 20 lesions. So I fit McDonald's criteria and they were able to give me a diagnosis at that time. They asked me if I wanted to do the spinal tap. I said, well, do I have enough lesions to show that I have MS? And they're like, yes, you fit McDonald's criteria. I'm like, great. There's no need for a spinal tap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah, so then I started seeing the neurologist that diagnosed me and went from there. So that was my diagnosis experience. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing. There's some parallels with mine because I, same thing, the right side went to pot. I ended up in an emergency. But one of the things that always amazes me, and when you meet people that work on the inside of healthcare, I'm not necessarily surprised because they've got to give bad news to people all the time. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think they forget to just to handle it with a little bit of sensitivity. I remember when I got my official diagnosis, you know, the neuro tells me and then I get whisked into another room and then I'm sitting with an MS nurse and she just basically wants to, she's just telling me here, you're going you're gonna to start taking Capaxone, but there was no real like, it was very, very clinical. Do you know what I mean? It was cold. Mm -hmm. Very cold. Yeah, I understand. And you're dealing with this impact of this diagnosis and trying to understand what's my life going to be like now. And this person's looking at you just like, okay, so, you know, you're going to inject it, you know, once a day, da, 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 and no, but then again, I mean, if you're doing that, you know, two or three times a day for several years, you would just become numb to it, I would imagine. Yeah, it was, uh, for me, it was more so like the diagnosis wasn't confirmed and he wasn't giving me a diagnosis. He was just giving me information. Mm -hmm. But one, I'm like, most people don't talk about demyelination. Like, that's not a normal term that you throw around. So I'm like, I don't understand. And then he's like, well, basically, you have lesions on your C2, C3. I'm like, again, not a, like, lesion, you know. I'm thinking cancer at the time because I don't understand what lesion means. Like, it's just not broken down in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't a, a definitive diagnosis. And so um, I, d I don't know if it was better that I like sat on a gurney, not sat, lay, crying, trying to cover my head with the sheet so that no one could see me crying because mm -hmm. I, I knew it. That, like when he said it, I knew I had it. You know, it just everything started making sense. I obviously like wanted to confirm it. But um, the way that I was treated and just like left in a hallway because I, you know, I didn't have any respiratory problems or heart problems, so I wasn't warranted a room with a machine. Like I just got hallway space, so that was really hard because they also wouldn't um, admit me until there was a diagnosis. Um, so it was just so it was so tough. Um, and thankfully, I had social media, so I could, you know, I looked up uh, hashtag MS on Instagram and hashtag multiple sclerosis, and thankfully, I found hashtag MS Warrior overnight and so I just started going through like reams and reams of people um, tackling the disease in a way where they weren't going to let it get the best of them so I thankfully started having that mindset so early on in my diagnosis well I think it's important man for me I just I got for lack of a better way of putting it, I just got really pissed off so <laughs> I just decided that uh, do I want to be a career patient or do I want to live my life so uh, mm. yeah so, okay, so 2014, you get mm -hmm. the diagnosis. How does how do you go from the diagnosis to all the different th 
different things that you're into right now. And we'll get to all that stuff in a minute. But how did you go from diagnosis to putting yourself out there and developing, you know, basically your brand and what you're doing now? Yeah. It, so it was interesting because I, as I, so after I got admitted, as I'm lying in the bed, my mom drove down from, uh, I was living in Toronto at the time and my parents are in Ottawa where I live now, but my mom drove down immediately to be there with me. And I remember just lying in the hospital bed as I started getting the first steroid treatment. And, uh, because I already had an online personal brand, I guess I was a, a fitness competitor and for lack of a better word, like a fitness blogger, um, I was always living life online. So I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell my community that I have MS? And I was like picking the picture. Like I was fine. I was looking at quotes on Pinterest and I was drafting the post in my head. And then a day later I announced it. Like I literally spent no time thinking about it. I just wanted to have my community surround me. I just wanted love. Like I wanted to get as much hope and love as possible. And I got that from my community through um, other things that I had experienced in my life. So it just like intuitively, I wanted to kind of reach out um, and receive as much like cheerleading as possible. Like you've got this, like if, if any, you know, if anyone can handle this disease, it's you. Like it was that type of messaging that I got back that I really like yearned for. So I'm glad I posted about it. What's fascinating now is I, I didn't think twice about making it public and now, you know, living in the community a lot longer and knowing a lot of people that keep it a secret uh, because they don't want to be seen as weak or treated differently as at work. I hadn't even thought about that. So I immediately put it out on my blog. I immediately started sharing about it on social media. And I just started sharing my what I call a health journey on my blog. So I would share about appointments I was going to different holistic treatments I was trying. And I was just documenting everything. And it, for me, it was really a way of journaling, which is kind of how my blog started in the beginning from a fitness journey perspective. And it just evolved from a, a health journey perspective. So I can like, sometimes I'm like, I wonder what supplements I was on three years ago. Like I just go back because it's documented in my blog. So it's super helpful for me. But in the process, I didn't even realize that I was helping other people and people were reaching out saying, you know, I didn't even consider stress management until you said you were going to an acupuncturist. So it's been kind of neat to, um, build the MS community through my sharing um, because I absolutely love surrounding myself with people who have similar mindsets um, and can share tips and tricks. Like that's what's been really cool about um, building the, the personal brand um, with MS. And I was an obstacle course racer at the time and I was determined to not do any like I didn't want to forsake any of the races that I had already signed up for I had already signed up for 15 by November of 2014 and I was diagnosed in December and I was like crap like I've got a whole lot of races that I need to do um and I only really had about three weeks where the the steroid treatment really got the best of me and by the end of January, I was training again. I had been cleared by doctors. And I was like, okay, I'm like going to show MS who's boss. Um, and I did 20 races that year. Side note, developed adrenal fatigue from that. But that's a whole other like overachiever story. Because <laughs> 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 um, I, I remember posting pictures like MS stands for mighty strong. Like I just wanted to show MS who was boss. Um <laughs> Uh, which I'm learning that MS is my, I, I call it my sidekick now, teaching me how to treat myself differently. Um, and definitely learn that as I tried to, I tried to like overachieve my healing um, and have definitely kind of taken a step back in recent years. Um, but yeah, so that's what, that's how the blog eventually kind of adapted from pure fitness to uh, health and lifestyle. And then I launched a podcast in 2016. It's around my personal brand, around being an alpha female. But the 
the main goal is to talk to ambitious women about how they take care of themselves. And, can you, and, before you go further here, can you, um, yeah, for sure. can you maybe describe for the listeners what you mean by alpha female? I mean, I, I read through your website and I, and I, I, I really like the, you know, the state of mind, but I think it's important to, to while you're talking about to maybe back, step, take a best step back and explain what you mean by an alpha female. Mm-hmm. So I had been nicknamed an alpha female by a coworker a really long time ago. And, um, the blog had always been called, you know, an alpha female blog. And I remember, okay, so this is how it ties in with MS. Um, I remember a hate thread being started online about me. And one of the comments was, what gives her the right to call herself an alpha female? And I said, very good point. What does give me the right? It's just a nickname I've had. So I created a definition around it. And that's how the podcast was actually born. So an alpha female is um, an assertive and ambitious woman who goes after her goals. Uh, but she's an intellectual and uh, and intelligent problem solver. She always puts herself first because she deserves self-care and self-love. And she simply picks her priority. And if that's, you know, 90% work one day, 10% life, it doesn't matter because it's not about balance. But it's about simply going after your goals, but being happy and healthy at the same time. So in the back of my mind... I'm creating this podcast about this ambitious female, but there's a huge focus on taking care of yourself because that's my mission in life is to teach people how to have proactive health, whether or not you have uh, an autoimmune disease diagnosis or not. I'm also in the back of my head trying to prevent people from developing autoimmune disease in the future. Um, without really talking about it because nobody la- nobody wants to talk about a disease that they don't have. But this is my way of kind of putting a proactive health message out into the world. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how the podcast was born. And it's been going strong for 2016, 17, 18, this is my fourth year recording now. Um, so it's been a lot of really amazing conversations with other alpha females. And they can, and people listening, if they want to check it out, they can find it on iTunes, like anywhere they would find a podcast. You've got it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Now, one other thing I want to, to to mention, I was just reading through your website. I noticed that you met the love of your life post diagnosis, mm-hmm. and, and, and the reason why I want to ask you all that's similar to me. I was diagnosed in two thousand seven, and I met my wife in two thousand nine. Mm. So maybe just talk a little about that, because I know for myself, I was scared out of my mind when I met my wife Andrea. Um, we went on probably f- five or six dates before I told her. Mm. Um, but I remember telling her that I was just, I thought, you know what, I'm going to tell her. And if she doesn't, if she doesn't bolt for the door, then, mm-hmm. um, you know, then, cause like I knew pretty early on that, that she was like, I knew within the first hour of knowing her that that was it for me. Mm. Um, but maybe just talk about that. Cause I know for a lot of us, when post diagnosis, if you're still single, it's um, it can become an obstacle and become intimidating. So maybe we'll just highlight your story about that. Yeah, for sure. Have you shared on your podcast what her reaction was when you told her? Uh, you know, we're almost fifty episodes in, and I started uh, four years ago, so I'm sure I've probably mentioned it at some point. Yeah. Um, but I can't say her reaction was. It was just like it wasn't a big deal. It was never. Yeah. It was just like okay, and I that was it. So, oh, so good. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, okay, let me take a step back. I, so I was actually dating someone at the time of my diagnosis. And I remember texting him the day that I drove myself to the hospital saying, Hey, you know, that like numb tingling I was feeling, uh, it's the whole right side of my body. Like I'm super worried. I'm just going to go to the hospital. And he's like, okay, let me know. <laughs> like, let me know how it goes. And I was like, Okay. And after like eight hours in the hospital, I'm like still here. Um, he's like, oh, okay. And like, he didn't come and see me once. Like didn't even ask if he wanted, like if I wanted company, it was super weird. I was like, this is just odd. And I remember texting him the diagnosis cause he wasn't picking up the phone. And then a few weeks later he broke up with me 
saying he couldn't be with someone that would potentially be in a wheelchair. And so when I started dating again, I literally just, I, that, that little experience, I could say little because, um, I hadn't been dating him for very long, but I was, I was shown that my disease potentially meant disability in the future and someone wouldn't want to be with me because of that. So I was terrified to start dating again. And I remember going out on a few dates and I was just like, do I tell them first date, second date? Like I literally, most of, like I would be sitting there listening to them at a dinner or coffee date and I'd be like, do I tell, do I tell them now? Like I was, I was just obsessing over it in my head. So I decided to stop dating um, and just kind of left it as, as that. I was like, let me put myself first. Let me start taking care of myself. And just figuring out how to live with MS instead of date. (laughs) Like, I'll just, I'll just put myself first for once. And, um, I eventually started, uh, dating a guy, uh, that I trained with at the gym that I was training for obstacle course races. And we ended up, um, in a, in a, a friendship that developed into more over the course of the year. And that was coming to an end at the end of the, at the end of that year, so the year after my diagnosis, and I went home to Ottawa for a Thanksgiving weekend, and there was an obstacle course racing gym that had just opened up, and I was like, okay, cool, like, I've got obstacle course racing championships in a few weeks, so like, let me go and just get my workout in there, and so I talk about how I walked into the gym, and all I heard was someone yell, havoc incoming, and this huge German Shepherd, part husky, like was just barreling towards me. And that is our our eldest dog. Um, and so I met Havoc first and fell in love with the dog. And then I looked up and I met and I saw Mike, um, who is now my husband. And so he recognized me because I was blogging in the obstacle course racing world. And he had read a few of my blogs and had seen the announcement that I was um, living with MS, we had organized a race in Toronto called Race for the Cure, where I had um, raised funds for the MS Society with an obstacle course race at the facility I was training at. And so he kind of knew of me and he knew I had MS. So I didn't have to tell him, which was really amazing. Um, but I'm going through my workout and I remember getting... Sorry, uh, I just have to say that is pretty yeah. awesome that he already knew. Yeah. I just know from my perspective when somebody doesn't know and it's like, you know, wondering how to say it. So anyway, yeah. sorry, can, please continue. Uh, yeah. So I didn't really like have to say like, hey, did you know I have a mess? Um, so I was, I was just going through my workout and I got overheated, which is when I get symptoms now. Um, and I was super frustrated because I couldn't do the monkey bars because I had no grip strength in my right hand. Um, and he came over. He was kind of following me around the gym and I didn't really realize it until I look back. Um, at it and he was just kind of following me around and he came over he's like are you okay I'm like yeah I'm just I just can't use my right hand he's like is this one of your MS symptoms I'm like oh yeah like just kind of taken aback that he would ask about MS so we started chatting and he was asking me questions around like how I take care of myself and you know how it's been going the you know the first year with um the sidekick Uh, So that was really nice. But I was still technically dating the guy that I was seeing. So I went home and we didn't really we didn't really talk. Uh, I ended the relationship with the guy that I was seeing. And Mike and I had stayed in touch, just kind of chatting back and forth about races. He was giving me tips for training and like tackling obstacles. And when he found out I had ended the relationship, he was just like, I want to be with you. I, I don't care what that looks like. Like, I just want to spend my entire life with you. And I was like, what, whoa, what, what is happening? Um, so my husband knew the moment I left that gym on Thanksgiving weekend, he turned to his business partner and said, I'm going to marry that woman. And then we like this guy. So- he, I, I was very <laughs> yeah. similar with my wife, but anyway, please continue. Yeah. So he waited patiently. He didn't want to like step on any toes or disrespect anyone. Um, and the moment we had ended, uh, the relationship, he's like, you're mine. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, started dating New Year's Eve. Uh, I had gone home for Christmas and so we started seeing each other over the Christmas holidays. We did long distance for literally 
less than three months. And then I said, okay, if you want to be with me, like, let's do it. Um, and because he had just opened just the gym in Ottawa, I said I would find a marketing job in Ottawa. So I quit in March and moved in April. And we've been together ever since. This See, is- that's a fant- I, I know that's a fantastic story. And I, I hope you were comfortable sharing that. I just know that people listening, mm-hmm. uh, it can be helpful for people. So Yeah. Yeah. I don't talk a lot about like how MS and the, and the whole dating thing um, started because I was I was super scared to tell people, but the fact that he already knew and that he showed interest in it and he's been so supportive, you know, I literally picked up my life from Toronto, moved to Ottawa, moved in with him, um, and I was already doing things to take care of myself, and he never questioned it. Like he eats an autoimmune paleo diet if I'm cooking for him and doing meal prep, which is usually the case. Um, he doesn't ever complain. He advocates for me at restaurants around my food choices. So he's been such a huge supporter. Um, and even like sometimes, usually like I'm a pretty big, he calls me a pain baby. Um, like if I go for a run and it's 30 degrees outside and I know I'm going to come home with symptoms and I come home and I'm crying and frustrated with my body. He's just like, here's an ice pack, get over it. You'll cool down in 10 minutes and be fine. <laughs> so, That's um, fantastic. yeah. So he's really good at like not letting me like get the best of my woe is me mentality, which I can have at times. So. Well, you just mentioned diet and that was, and there's it kind of dovetails into some other questions I want to ask you. Mm-hmm. Um, my first date with my wife we discovered about 10 minutes into the date that we ate a very similar diet she was doing it for her asthma oh, okay and i was doing it for my ms so i mean you mentioned the paleo style i in, in around two or three months after i got diagnosed in 2007 i'd come across uh dr lauren Cordain's Cordain, paper that kind of okay. kick-started the whole paleo thing mm-hmm. um and i've been roughly following that since 2007. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about your diet and then I have another question I want to ask you. So my journey was after I announced it online, I got bombarded with advice and opinions. And I think I wrote a blog post about like the four different types of people you'll meet. Those that will say like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Those that will immediately send you articles to read, books to read. Um, those that just ask you simply like, what, 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 what can I do? Like, what do you need? Something practical. Like, can I do your groceries for you or or your laundry? Like what will help you most? Um, and then there's the people that will try to sell you snake oil. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think it's really, really hard the the group of people that send you advice and articles to read because it's super overwhelming, but that's where a lot of my, education and research jumped off of. So I kind of would file all those messages. And then when I was in the headspace to actually read them, I'd start diving into them. So I was sent the um, Dr. Terry Wells's uh, TED Talk video on Mind Your Mitochondria and then ordered her book, Wells Protocol. So that was my first introduction into uh, nutrition and digestive health in terms of um, being part of your holistic healing journey. Um, and I'm a, I'm a reader. So at the time I was working for Rakuten Kobo. So thankfully I got a lot of eBooks for free. <laughs> um, and I downloaded the autoimmune solution by Amy Myers, just simply by like Googling autoimmune disease books. And so those were my first two books that I read right out of the gate. And um, I started on the Walls Protocol, but got super overwhelmed with the amount of green vegetables needed to eat every day. And after reading The Autoimmune Solution, I started understanding that um, there was more kind of building blocks of health that would potentially um, support my body to have a better quality of life. And from there, I discovered the autoimmune paleo protocol through the autoimmune wellness ladies, Mickey Trescott and Angie Alt, um, who have, what is it, autoimmunewellness.com. And I used their website from the get-go for an elimination diet. Um, So after Wall's protocol was a little too overwhelming for me, 
I looked at what an elimination diet was for the autoimmune paleo protocol. And I said, okay, this is something that I think I can do. Let me try it for 30 days. Um, I also was obsessed with just like gaining all of this knowledge and working with different healthcare practitioners. So I remember doing an online consultation with a registered holistic nutritionist who lives with MS. Um, and she introduced me the concept of leaky gut and how that may have been a contributing factor to me developing the disease. So I was gaining all of this knowledge and then I just said, let me try the, the elimination diet. I started seeing huge successes in terms of just like my energy and how I felt on a daily basis. So I've um, just continued. I have been able to successfully reintroduce some foods, others I have kept out. Um, and so when people ask me like, how do you eat? Like, what's your diet? I just usually say autoimmune paleo. Yeah. For me, what, what I've found, and I, I like that you brought up the, the elimination diet. I'm at the point now I can feel when I've consumed something I shouldn't have, my yeah. body immediately reacts to it. Mm -hmm. I either start bloating or I just feel gross or I start to get, kind of get headachy. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very modified paleo. And it's just been a process of elimination and experimentation over, since 2007 to kind of really figure out what's optimal and what's, mm -hmm. you know, especially with distance running and that kind of thing. I really have to, um, I've really played around with it and I've kind of only in the last two years, I think I've really figured it out. Um, mm -hmm. it, but it took a lot of just trial and error. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I knew I still needed the right nutrients to fuel me for obstacle course training um, so I needed to figure out exactly what carbs I could consume um, and which ones didn't make me feel like I was falling asleep on a daily basis super early in the day so that was that was kind of a, a neat science experiment I love being my own science experiment um, I love being able to try things and uh, I think this process I think this disease diagnosis has also helped me really become way more in tune with my body. Like I know um, based on how I start a day, uh, whether or not uh, even like from a mindset perspective, if I might develop a migraine later in the day from like the food choices I have or how I'm reacting to perceived stress in my life. So it's taught me to be just so much more aware, listen to my body and just be so much more in tune so that I can take care of myself better. Now I want to switch, switch gears again because I want to make sure we get as much <laughs> in as we can. Uh, one other thing, and I'm just, I, I just picked out stuff from your website that mm -hmm. caught I my love eye. It. I love my it. wife is an acupuncturist mm. and um, obviously, you know, I, I get acupuncture. And I want to know what your experience is. And have you tried scalp acupuncture? But I always get like one in the top of my scalp for um, like the stress point that's at the very top of your head. But that's the, the only one I've really ever gotten. Well, she, uh, my, my wife's found, she found after digging around, she had found some points specific to MS. Mm. And she actually slides... And this may be graphic for a little too graphic for some listeners, but she actually, when she puts the needle in, she actually will slide it along my scalp down a lot, a lot deeper than you would normally go. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's not really painful. It's a different sensation for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've found some relief with symptom relief with it. So anyway, please just continue on oh, what your experience awesome. has been with the acupuncture. That's awesome. Um, so I was seeing an acupuncturist purely I, I feel like I'm I'm glad I had um, a fitness journey leading up because I was already seeing so many different practitioners and when I went to see them after the diagnosis they were able to adjust treatment so I was seeing an acupuncturist for um, all of the many injuries I was giving myself <laughs> because uh, the year that I ran the 20 races, I ran most of the races on a sprained ankle because I refused to not run a race. Um, and uh, so I was seeing them for ankle healing. Then I got like a an actual pinched nerve in my shoulder and uh, was healing that. And then they just started giving me acupuncture for stress management because I had done a ton of research around stress. 
uh, being a contributing factor for autoimmune disease. Um, and then digestive health. So when I mentioned that I was trying to really heal my digestive system so that I didn't have, and I'll be graphic, but uh, I had diarrhea after every meal and that was just normal for me. And then finally I was honest on an intake form with a practitioner and they were like, okay, diarrhea that much is really not normal. Like, can we address this? So the acupuncturist I was seeing who was trained in traditional Chinese medicine did digestion points and also based on my food journal that I had shared with her, made a few suggestions uh, because the Walls Protocol tells you to get eight cups of vegetables. So I was trying to get as many vegetables as possible and I was doing a green smoothie every morning. I cannot digest raw vegetables. Just like it's not possible and green smoothies go through me really fast. And so a simple piece of advice from the acupuncturist was to do more warming smoothies with like cinnamon and ginger and nutmeg in the morning and then like save vegetables for later in the day and to always steam them. Um, so I was trying to cut corners in my meal prep and I was eating everything raw. I was like chewing on snap peas and green beans. And she's like, can you please just steam them and see if that helps? And like little tweaks like that, like I'm just sitting in an appointment for stress management acupuncture and I'm getting advice on my digestion. So I absolutely love acupuncturists who are trained with TCM um, because they just have so much knowledge uh, outside of just needling that is super cool to incorporate in your healthcare team. Yeah, uh, that's true because I know with my wife, she – um when you mentioned she's trained in TCM as well. Mm -hmm. And I get lots of advice. Um, we don't, <laughs> we don't always see eye to eye. Um, <laughs> but as I tell her, I usually come around because she's normally right. <laughs> you just don't want to admit it right away. Uh, I'm yeah. stubborn. I mean, okay. when you, I think to do ultra marathons, you have to be a little bit stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I, actually, I would say a lot stubborn. A lot and stubborn. So, and I think with my wife, she's uh, she's comfortable enough to let me come to my come to come to it on my own. Mm. Um, but uh, we got to switch gears again because I want to talk about your book too, and I want to make sure we get this all in. So, can you? And I haven't read the book for listeners. I mean, I, will, I only discovered you had a book on the weekend when I was trying to do research for this for this uh, episode. Mm -hmm. But can you? maybe give people an overview of what love lost life found eight practical steps to heal a broken heart, what it's about and how that came to be. For sure. So in 2012, I was engaged to be married and I ended up calling off that wedding a month before and left a very toxic relationship where I had really lost who I was. I had lost, um, you know, just, uh, who I was as a person, and I'd really lost myself in the relationship. So my ex-fiance lived with mental illness, and I was trying to constantly take care of him. So the first few chapters of the book is simply sharing my story and my truth around the relationship and warning signs that I ignored, reasons why I stayed in the relationship longer um, than I should have. And then the rest of the book, so the rest of the chapters are just different ways that I found my life again, uh, a life that I love, uh, started taking care of myself again from a, a health standpoint, um, learning how to date again, how to enjoy myself, doing uh, like rediscovering things that I love. I'm obsessed with seasonal bucket lists and that was what came out of that healing time because I didn't know how to be single again, I didn't know how to date. Um, so I created these lists of things that I love to do or I wanted to try. Um, and I would, you know, share them with friends or I would go do things on my own and it became a dating tactic. I would hand my like summer bucket list to a guy and I'd be like, pick something off the list for our date. And that way, um, like dates were always really fun, even if it didn't work out. Um, now the seasonal bucket list has obviously evolved with my husband. So like we're creating bucket lists together or I'm still doing things on my own or with friends or with um, my husband. So that's something that came out of the, the healing process. Um, but I, I wrote the book because 
I discovered after my diagnosis, so diagnosed in 2014, I was already writing the book at that time, and I published it in 2016. And in 2014, after I was diagnosed, someone suggested the book When the Body Says No by Gabor Mate, I believe is the author. And he's a doctor on the West Coast. And he wrote the book basically, I don't know if you've read it. Um, No, I haven't. Uh, he qualitatively and like quantitatively groups his patients together. And there's basically a chapter on different diseases and the MS chapter, if I can summarize, and I, I, I hope I do it justice, uh, talked about how a lot of his MS patients were a type overachievers, um, didn't really know how to experience their feelings. Um, so like hands up if you like bottle your emotions, I'm raising both my hands Um, (laughs) I'm raising my feet too (laughs) and had gone through a toxic relationship in the past and I remember so this is when Periscope was really popular and I was Periscoping every single morning I was just like learning how to be on video I was having a super fun time I was sharing things that I was going through and I remember doing a Periscope and I shared that I just finished reading the chapter on MS And I broke down crying, having a revelation that potentially the relationship that I had been in was another contributing factor to me being on the autoimmune spectrum to developing MS. And that's when I realized that uh, I actually started going um, to uh, to psychotherapy at the time Um, because I had gone to psychotherapy right after I had called off the wedding because I was, um, you know, just a a big mess at the time. But after I came to this realization, I hadn't really processed a lot of um, feelings around uh, grief. So I joke all the time that in the hospital bed, I went through all four stages of grief to acceptance as fast as possible. And it didn't really go through anger, sadness, or whatnot. So I went back to therapy as I was, you know, finishing up the book and had come to this revelation um, just to understand um, and also give myself a little grace. Because when you do all this research and start learning how to take care of yourself differently, I was really hard on myself. Like, why didn't you do this sooner? If you had just cut out gluten and dairy so much earlier, maybe you never would have developed the disease. Like I had some of the, like the worst self-talk ever. Um, So the book was really interesting as part of my healing journey, not only for healing my heart, but also understanding like what role um, mental health plays in a disease healing journey as well. And also like learning how to give yourself grace and not be so hard on yourself for things that are in your past, because that's, that's all that they are. They're just simply in, in your path and it can simply inform you of how to take care of yourself differently in the future. That's awesome. Now we have about eight and a half minutes left. Mm -hmm. So I want to leave it up to you because I mean, again, um, you know, for the people listening, the best way to uh, understand why I, I have to try and compact a lot of the stuff, go to robinbaldwin.com. That's Robin with a Y. Um, and you can check out, there's links to everything that she's she's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, is there something that you specifically wanted to get to today that, that, to, 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 for my listeners to understand or to know? or mm-hmm. uh, Like, what do you want to talk about? So I'd love to talk about the the new... I guess it's a social enterprise that I'm building called Autoimmune Thriving. Um, So I started an Instagram earlier this year. Um, I had already secured Autoimmune Thriving, like the URL and the Instagram handle, a few years ago. Um, But I didn't feel ready to really kind of sit in this space because I've been building everything under Robin Baldwin. But... um, I have a lot of people in my community with autoimmune disease, but I don't talk about it a lot. Um, And I've just been called to talk about it a little bit more. So my mission is to empower those living with an autoimmune sidekick to thrive and not just survive. Because I truly believe that when we, and Chris Carr, who is an author of Crazy Sexy, uh, I think it's called Crazy Sexy Cancer, 
she talks about how it's our responsibility to participate in our wellness and not just our illness. And that's really kind of stuck with me over the years. Um, so it's, it's really three pillars. I uh, got my yoga teacher certification in February. My husband, uh, that was my wedding present, was to send me to Bali to get my yoga training because I wouldn't have ever done it for myself. And when I came back for Bali, I was trying to think about how I can serve the autoimmune community um, differently. So I have, you know, my online blog where people have been reading about how to take care of themselves differently, but I crave community. And so I um, created a retreat in May, and I'm hoping to repeat these probably like two or three times a year, uh, where I offer restorative yoga, I bring in guest speakers uh, from different healing modalities, um, and then I feed everyone a really, really fancy autoimmune paleo meal. So that's kind of the first pillar. Um, and then the second one that I'm billi- building is an online program for those that are newly diagnosed. So I was trying to figure out well, like, what problem can I solve in the world? And I'm really good at organizing information and presenting it in an easy to understand way. And um, I'm a project manager in my full-time job. Um, I work for a marketing agency as an account director. So I'm constantly like organizing projects and technically that's what I did with my healing. Like I mapped it all out and I was just like, okay, you're going to, you're, you're going to work on this building block, of, you know, of nutrition this month. And then next month you're going to tackle stress. And so I want to be able to do that for people in a way that they, they can kind of take it and it's a choose your own adventure. So they take all of the information and then they say, okay, based on what you've presented with uh, nutrition, I'm going to tackle nutrition to start. And then when they're ready to tackle stress management, they'll work on that part. And so that's launching in August. I'm really excited to launch it on August 7th. I'm opening, um, I guess, the cart, so to say. Uh, And then the third pillar, which is part of both of them, is any yoga retreat I host or the online program that I'm launching, I'm always going to take a portion of the proceeds and put it in this treatment fund. So that's the the language that I'm calling it right now. I, I haven't completely figured it out, but it's this treatment fund that I'm making available to people in the autoimmune community who may not have benefits. Um, this is you know from a Canadian perspective, may not have a benefit plan, or they may be simply struggling financially. And so I want to have this fund that is available for those with an autoimmune disease that they can, you know, ask for some of the proceeds from the sale of either the retreat or the online program, and they can put it towards their, their healing. Because trying to heal yourself from a holistic perspective, in addition to anything conventional you're doing, can be really expensive. Um, and I'll use an example, like in Canada, if you have a benefit program, uh, you may only have, say, $500 to put towards acupuncture. And that may be, you know, maybe five or six appointments throughout the year. So if you're going monthly, you're only able to go see someone for six months. And then you kind of have to, like, you know, either stretch it out or you don't see a practitioner. Um, so I'd really be able to um, take these funds and make them available to people that really need them. So I don't know how that's going to look yet. Uh, from the first yoga retreat, I put enough um, proceeds aside from the profits to pay for somebody to get a massage with a local Ottawa massage therapist. Um, and I have yet to have someone raise their hand and say, I would like that money. So I've like posted on social media. There's an autoimmune paleo group that I'm a part of. And I've even put it in there saying like, if you've already maxed out your benefits for the year, you don't have benefits, like please raise your hand or DM me privately because um, I guess the the only thing that I'm struggling with is uh, there may be some, you know, people don't like raising their hand and saying like, I need help financially. So that may be my struggle, but this is my mission. Like I truly want to serve the autoimmune community this way. That's amazing. Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got like two and a half minutes left, um, and I just realized, would you consider being on the podcast again? And there's a reason why I'm asking. 
I would love to. You don't have to. Okay, because I'm actually going to be in Ottawa. um, Okay. Near the end of August or the beginning of September for my for my day job. Okay. Um, as soon as I get those dates, I'll let you know. Uh, because it would be nice to do a live one. Mm, Well, I guess this is live, but I mean, actually, so we can actually talk face to face rather than over Skype. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So if you're into that, I will. Uh. I, as soon as I get that figured out when I'm going to be there, I will let you know. Um, now, as we wind this up, where can people find you? Because you I mean you've got all the social media. So is it is it one name that you use for all? Yeah. So it's it's super easy to find me on robinbaldwin.com, which you already said, Robin with a Y, Baldwin, like the Baldwin brothers. Um, and then there's a link to the autoimmune thriving program there so people can navigate there if they're curious about that there's a link to the book and then all of my social media platforms are are linked there as well yeah what would be cool if we could do it if we could pull this off and i'll have to figure if i can figure out the technical part of it is if we could do like a uh, a short run down the Rideau canal and mm-hmm. do the podcast while we were running i don't know how that would sound though if we can pull that <laughs> off but i'll see i'll see what i can figure out do you imagine people are, someone like tunes into the podcast for the first time they haven't heard before and they're like, why are they heavy breathing like that? Like, this is weird. <laughs> I, I actually did one last summer where I was, I was kayaking in a lake. Yeah. And you can hear the paddling. Okay. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't the best audio I ever produced because I didn't consider wind. Okay. Yeah. So it took, it took forever for me to try and get the wind noise out as much as possible. So you could actually hear what I was saying. So, yeah, uh, I'm always trying different stuff just because for me, this is just a hobby, like doing the podcast. So, yeah, that's so much. Uh, I'm now going to practice talking while running and people in my neighborhood are going to think I'm crazy. Well, I take people on runs with me all the time. Cause they're like, I want to run with you. And I can't understand for the life of me why anyone would want to run with me. Like, I, <laughs> I guess I sort of understand it, but it's yeah. not like I'm a fast runner. Or like a world class runner by any stretch of the imagination, mm-hmm. but I mean, so I'm getting pretty used to talking and running because usually the people that want to run with me, they're not in as good a shape, <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> on quite a bit slower than normal. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. Anyway, we got to wind this up. So, Robin, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, for the listeners out there, RobinBaldwin.com, uh, Robin with a Y, and as she said, Baldwin, as in the Baldwin. Brother. That'd be hilarious if you were related to them, but no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks again for doing this. And uh, as soon as I find out uh, about Ottawa, I'll let you know when I'm there. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, no problem. And uh, we'll talk to you again real soon. Sounds good. All right. So that was my conversation with Robin. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It was awesome having her on the show. And if you're like Robin and you'd like to be a guest on the show, if you have a story to tell that's MS-related, please reach out to me at sean at ownmultiplesclerosis.com. That's S-E-A-N at O-W-N multiple sclerosis, all one word, dot com. You can also find me on Twitter at MS Long Run and on Instagram at MS Long Run. However, I'm rarely on social media. Well, that's it for episode number 47. I don't know what's going to be next, but there'll be one real soon. Talk to you later.